Alrighty. Um, cool. Let's let's rock and roll here. Uh, so, um, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, I I'm hanging in there. Uh, to switch to a new room. My parents are in town, so it might look kind of funny. The lighting's off here, but you know we'll survive. Um, and we're here not to look at me, but to learn about economics anyway. So it's fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, the plan for today is, well, one, I actually kind of want to do some admin stuff as usual, um, and kind of think about the, the rest of the term. So, uh, I just, I just today put up a schedule for, um, reading the new geography of jobs by, uh, Enrico Moretti. So that's, um, considerably shorter, I think about half the length of, uh, why nations fail. So we're going to do that in about three weeks. Okay. So I put up, um, show you, let's see, where is it? I put up the, uh, uh, schedule here. So we're going to do Jeff for, for next week on Tuesday, we're going to do kind of base things on Tuesday for next week, Tuesday, let's try and do intro and chapters one and two. That's about, that's like 75 pages, three, four, another 75. And then I think the last one is about a hundred. Okay. So it's not too much. Um, yeah, uh, so we'll do that and then we'll, we'll talk about it at some point once, once things seem kind of uh, ready. Okay, um, so that's number one. Okay, and then number two is the term is, is proceeding rather quickly, but um, I think we're, we, we do need to get into these projects. So pretty soon I'm going to kind of formally assign uh, the first kind of mini project. Okay, and that's where you're going to be looking at um, a particular country. Okay. Uh, and just kind of doing an analysis of that country, kind of historical and modern day, using the tools that we've kind of talked about. Okay, so I would say we have kind of a set of uh, qualitative tools, you might say, from Why Nations Fail. Okay, just kind of like thinking about things historically, um, thinking about um, the formation of, of certain institutions historically and why, why that is in, in particular cases. Okay. Um, so we have that whole set of tools and also thinking about comp like competition, both economic and political and contestability and the nexus of the political and the economic. So all of those sort of frames um, we have available to think about stuff mostly historically. Okay. Um, and then we also have kind of the more modern stuff we've done, which is a little bit more data oriented because there actually is hard data on that um, for the most part uh, of thinking about, you know, the cause, the cause, the proximate cause of growth in terms of capital accumulation and technology, and how to analyze that. Okay, and then on top of that, we're just we're doing beyond GDP. Should be done with that by next time, um, and so we'll have that how to think about stuff that is a GDP, and but but it's nonetheless important for uh, livelihoods. Okay, so um, so I think we got we got some good stuff. We can we can now apply that, right? So what I want you to do is, and I'll be I'll, I'll post like a document. Um, which is which is too long and probably probably going to be too long and wordy, but it'll describe what I'm looking for basically. Um, yeah, it'll be like a page. Um, and uh, yeah, so but 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 essentially, what I want you to do is choose a country, focus on that country, give me the give me the whole analysis, okay, in whatever tools you want to use. So you, I would use all of those different tools that we have available. Um, you can choose how much you want to focus on one or the other, okay. Some of that might be dictated by what's interesting. Some of it might be dictated by what sort of data is available and things like that. Okay. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so that's going to be like, we're going for like 10 pages, double spaced kind of thing. Okay. Um, in like, I think you should be inspired by why nations fail, uh, the ability to just like, just like dish out some, some pros on, on particular countries. So they certainly did so at length. Um, so, uh, I think we should be good there. Um, but you know, let's, you, know, you want to keep it focused. Okay. Have, if you have, if you want to have a particular central argument and, and kind of structure your argument around that, that's cool. If you just want to give me an overview, that's fine too. You don't have to have some earth shattering thesis about a country. Okay. Um, yeah, pick something that you're interested in, I guess that seems just makes things easier. Um, you can pick Botswana if you want. I think why you should fail. I feel like they 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 did a lot on that. I mean, so you can pick if you want to pick countries that were heavily covered in why you should fail. That's fine. Ideally, you would bring 
you know, kind of a different, maybe a different perspective um, on it. Uh, but there are a ton of countries that were just almost not at all mentioned in why they should fail. So you can, you can also do that. You could pick the U.S. if you want. I probably wouldn't. I feel like we've, been, we've, we've studied the U.S. quite extensively. Uh, so let's just say don't pick the U.S. Sorry. Uh, but there's, you know, 200x countries out there that you can, you can still choose from. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the plan. I'll, um, and I'll put something more formal this week. Okay. And that'll be due. Let's, I haven't decided 100%, but I'm thinking like three to four weeks. That'll be due. I need to, I need to figure out the, the, the sort of the end game for this term. Okay. But I think, I think it's going to be three weeks and then we'll do another project on technology after that. Okay. So yeah. Um, all right. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and I think that's it for, for admin stuff. All right. Um, okay. So the plan for today is to, to all uh, probably almost finish up beyond GDP. I could be ambitious and say, we're going to do something after that, but probably we won't have time. Okay. So, um, and basically, you know, we're, we're going to pick up where we left off last time, incorporating new stuff. So last time we were, we were thinking about leisure. Okay. Um, we were thinking about how to incorporate leisure. Okay. We basically did incorporate leisure. Okay. So let's, let's jump over there. So, um, where were we? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to scroll back a little bit here and review. Okay. So we have this wall of algebra, but the, the end result at the end was, was we got this what we call this compensating differential down here, this lambda, okay, which which sort of gave us a way to to summarize the differences between two countries um, in one number, okay. So so we're only entertaining still a very limited scope, which is consumption um, and leisure, okay. So only two things, but they're kind of important, um, and we're we're sort of combining those into this one index, okay. So we started out with just that first term. Right, without leisure, and then we added in leisure, we got this index, and this sort of eta, it turns out, is is important. Okay, and the assumptions we had to make to get here were basically this this utility function up here at the top. Right, we had to assume that we kind of know what the utility function looks like roughly. Okay, um, and then hopefully we can figure out what eta is, uh, and then that that should be good enough. Okay, so we made we made a what's called a functional form assumption about the utility function. Okay. Uh, but we didn't, we left sort of one free parameter, which was eta, which we're going to hopefully be able to estimate, uh, or at least inform ourselves from in the data. Okay. Um, yeah. And so in terms of how we're going to use this or how we could use this, this Lambda factor here, uh, this approach, so we can compare any two countries or any two time periods with this method, right? So we could, com we could look which is, you know, we could look at uh, the, the current year, you know, 2020 or more basically, you know, the 2018 data probably, um, and compare across different countries, which would be like a, a, a cross-sectional analysis, okay? Uh, or we could choose within a country, we could just say, let's just look at the U.S. and look at comparing the U.S. in, you know, 2020 to the U.S. in, you know, uh, 1970 or something, right? And so they'll have different consumption levels, they'll have different uh employment uh you know hours worked which we would apply different leisure levels um and so we can get a number there so we can go in in both directions okay if you think about it as like a grid of time and space i.e country we can go in either direction we go we could go we could compare the us today to france in 1970 if we wanted that's kind of mixing two things at once which maybe isn't advisable but we could in principle do it right so um yeah okay so we can use this for a bunch of different stuff um but there's still the eta factor What's up with eta? Okay, and that's, that's kind of what we went through last time. Okay, and and the goal was to say, okay, well, we, we know we can infer things about people's utility function by observing the choices that they make. Okay, and the, the particular choice we're going to look at is this labor leisure choice. Okay, um, yeah, and so we start with that that functional form here. And here I'm just I uh, let's see, I'm dropping uh, I. You know, usually we have I. I'm just going to drop that. This is some random country, okay? Um, and I'm saying let's think about what's going to happen if if you know we we just let people choose, okay? And we had to you know we had to think about okay, but what what is their budget constraint going to look like, okay? And at the end of the day, you know, it's 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 going to be simple, which is that if you work a certain amount H, you get a wage W. That means that your consumption is going to be C, okay? So 
you know, we are omitting some things here. Okay, so for one, we're assuming that people's income comes entirely from labor income. So they don't, for instance, have any uh, stocks thing, or, or bonds or anything like that. Okay, which I think most people actually don't. Okay, I mean, stock, stocks are a big part of the overall economy. But if you look at, you know, the fraction of people that actually own stocks is, is I forget, but it, it's, it's not close to 100%. It's, it's closer to 50%. Okay, so um, that's not so bad. Um, so we're assuming that basically you have no other sources of income. Okay, and we're assuming that you're not saving anything. Okay, so these are kind of important factors in the economy, but we're going to sort of let that go for now. All right. Um, okay, but if you if you do that, then you can get a really simple answer. Okay, and what you do is you just plug in for H, you know, H, you have some choice H, okay. Um, that gives you your consumption WH here for log of C. Okay, so this is log of C. And then L is just one minus H. That's just whatever time you have left over, you just, you do leisure, okay. Um, all right, and so then that, from that, we get this function which says like given a certain amount choice H, what's your overall utility? Okay, it's gonna look like this. And that's it's gonna be some kind of function which goes, you know, at, at at zero, if you don't work at all, you have no consumption. That's bad. Okay. And so you're gonna go to minus infinity. At one, you have no leisure, that's also bad. So you're gonna go to minus infinity, but in the middle, there's some point that maximizes that. Okay. And the way we get to that is by taking a derivative figure out, you know, at that point, the slope is going to be zero. That's where the derivative is going to be zero. And so that's what we're going to do here. Okay, so standard one dimensional optimization. Okay, and, you know, we go through the algebra. And lo and behold, we get a sim relatively simple answer, which is that h is just one over one plus eta. Okay, so um, well, what one interesting thing is that um, your h, the amount of time that you work, okay, is not a function of your uh, wage, okay? So oftentimes you might think that the amount of time that you work would be a function of your wage, okay? Um, and now, I mean, I guess this this reminds me, the other big assumption that we're making, which, which is actually important, is you actually can choose precisely how much you work, okay? So, you know, you go to, you know, you're in, um, I don't know, you're in high school, you're working at a pizza place, maybe you can work, uh, flexible hours, but a lot of jobs, you can't just walk in and be like, I want to work, you know, three hours a week and I want to work on these days. Okay. So, you know, there's often uh, back and forth with the boss and everything. So um, that's not so realistic all the time. Right. And then if, if you, if you go away from a wage job to like a salary job, you know, you kind of have to put in, you know, 40, 50, whatever hours per week. And it's not really that negotiable. Okay, so um, this is this is part of the assumption, and maybe it's not so realistic. Okay, but maybe things kind of balance out in the end. Okay, so maybe we can handle it. But you know, if we if we take all of that as given, then we get this result. You know, that that uh, h is one over one plus eta, and it doesn't depend on your wage. Now, the reason it doesn't depend on your wage is not because this shouldn't depend on your wage. It, it's just I made, you know, because we assumed everything was kind of logarithmic, I, I kind of made the, the assumptions to make that happen, okay, just to make the simplest possible answer, okay? So in reality, it may be that your, your, how much you work depends on your wage, okay? Because if you, uh, <clears throat> your wage goes up, you might think, you can think one of two things. You can think, well, oh, my wage went up, my, that working is more, you know, has higher returns, uh, things being equal, I'm going to work more, okay? Um, that's one logic you can employ. The other logic, which is actually the opposite is, well, my wage went up, so I can make just as much money by working less. So let's just work less, right? Um, so either of those are sometimes true. They're, they're sometimes in the sense that like, you could write down a utility function for which that logic A wor works, or you could write down a utility function in which logic B works, okay? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it just depends on on your preferences, okay, um, and how you make choices and such, okay. Here we kind of made it exactly so you you kind of in between logic A and logic B, where you just you actually just work the same amount. Those two forces sort of perfectly cancel out, okay. Uh, but in general, that's not going to be the case, right? So, but all we really wanted was something simple, and that's what we got, all right. So it, H is one over one plus eta. Now remember, 
H is how much you work. L, this cursive L thing is your leisure. And that's just the, the, the leftover time after when you're not working, you're doing leisure. Okay. We're ignoring, we're, I guess we're including sleep in this construction or sort of ignoring it. Um, what's one minus H? Well, okay. So one minus H would be one minus one over one plus eta. Okay. It's one of those combining the fractions things. So this is like one plus eta. One is equal to one plus eta over one plus eta. So you kind of align the fractions and you end up with eta over one plus eta. Okay, so that's L. You make sure. Okay. Um, all right, you can see if you add if you add these two together, you get um, one, which is the total amount of time. Okay, so your leisure is eta over one plus eta. That that means that as eta gets larger, you take more leisure. If you, the more you value leisure, the more leisure you take. All right. Um, okay. Uh, so how does, this, how does this help us? Well, this this is this is what we wanted to do so that we could sort of look at the data and infer eta. Okay, so we're gonna look at the data, okay, and um, kind of went into this last time, right? So you, if you work, uh, it's 168 hours in a week. If you work, let's say you work 50 hours, okay, uh, a week. Um, that's almost a third, okay. If you're on commute, whatever. Maybe maybe it gets a, gets you to a third, right? So. Um, that's probably a little on the high side, but, uh, let's say, but then there's the whole sleep thing, right? So let's say it's a third. Okay. Um, so it, you know, that, uh, sorry. So that's H, right? So, so H in the data is a third. Okay. And then the model is one, one over one plus eta. So what, what, what value for eta gets us to H being one third? Well, that would be eight equals two. Okay, so eight equals two, one plus eight is three, so that's one over three, right? So the the rough approximation would say that eight is equal to two, okay? I'm not saying that's exactly right, but that's gonna be a rough approximation, okay? So that means that if you just, you know, take my work, you know, sort of, if you believe everything that I just went through and eight equals two, we can use that in here, right? So then we, we're gonna figure out this, 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 compensating variation consumption equivalent thing, uh, lambda for a particular pair of countries or years or whatever. Um, just look at the ratio of consumption, look at the ratio of leisure, but then just square it. Okay, so you're, you, by squaring it, you're kind of amplifying it, right? So you're saying, take that proportional difference and square it. So it's now sort of, it's not twice as big, but it's something like twice as big. Okay, so um, and whatever, you know, the, the larger eta is, the more you're gonna amplify those leisure differences. Okay. Um, all right, so that's that's how we would use it, and we'll kind of see what that looks like a bit later on. Okay. Um, all right, so that's that's the general approach. Okay. Now there's some caveats. I have always a laundry list of caveats that I need to convey to you guys. Um, one of them is what it, what did we assume at the beginning was that eta we let that be a free parameter, but we're kind of implicitly assuming that it's the same for every country, right? So. That may or may not be true because um, you know even if you take this model, let's say you take this model literally, okay, in a, in the actual data, you know we don't see h equals a third for every country. We see h equals various different things. There's variation across different countries, okay. Um, and so, well, the first question you might ask is, well, why is that, right? Um, and there are many reasons for that, but it could just be that countries have different datas. They have different values for leisure. It could be that some countries are sort of better at leisure. Maybe they have better ideas for leisure, okay? Um, and, uh, or they have a social fabric that's more amenable to leisure. I don't know. You know, there's, there's a million different things you could rationalize it with. But, but you know, <clears throat> those differences do indicate that there could be differences in ADA, okay? Now, once you have differences in ADA, okay, that, that, that previous analysis where we found... I'm going to jump back once again. Uh, the previous analysis where we found lambda, okay, you know that if, if you had eta A and eta B, well, then things get more complicated, okay? It gets a little bit more complicated to, to compare. Actually, what you would, if you had different etas, uh, that's a C, C, B over C, A, it would look like, um, pretty sure, yeah, uh, it would look like, you know, B. You'd have this raised to a to b, and then you have la, but that would be raised to the a to a. Okay, so you can do it, which is kind of messier because you 
you know, in the in the in the first version we did that eta applies to both LB and LA. Here you need to have these different exponents. Okay, so it still works. It's just um more complicated. Which we could certainly do it though. Um now uh but but no, you want to think about what 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 is that like outside of the algebra, what would that really mean if you were doing this analysis? Okay, so let's say um you know, let's say that you're you're comparing France, the classical comparison, which I'm pretty sure is supported by the data. It's at least supported by the sort of general stereotypical story of, of the French taking more leisure, right? So they, they, they I, I believe this is true. Um, they, they take a bit more leisure and they have a bit lower income, okay? Um, right, so, so that would say, you know, H, F is lower, okay, which is equivalent to their leisure is higher, okay? Um, now, uh, if you use the same eta, okay, you you might do the, you you might do the calculation and say, okay, well, France has a little bit lower income, they have a little bit more leisure, okay, and you, you use whatever eta equals two. You might do the calculation and say, well, that means that Fran we did the calculation. It turns out that means France has a lower, still has a lower welfare, okay. So they. They, they do have the higher leisure with the lower income, but the balance of forces kind of indicates that they have the lower welfare, okay? But if if you were, and let's say that you did that with assuming they had the same eta, they had the same value for leisure. If you did the analysis again and assumed that the French had a higher value for leisure relative, say, to the US, uh, that that means that their 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 higher leisure level would, would get a, a bigger bonus, right? So that that exponent, I keep jumping back and forth here, I wish I could just scroll, that exponent, you know, instead of being common across these two, you'd have a higher exponent for the French leisure factor, right? Um, and so you you might then conclude that actually they have similar levels of welfare. Okay, so I guess what I'm saying is if you assume that they're the same, you might incorrectly conclude that the French have lower welfare when in fact they have the same welfare, okay? I'm not going to take a stand in what it, whether the French actually have a higher low, lower welfare than the U.S., but that that's a that's a danger. Is that by making this assumption, you sort of inappropriately penalize countries uh, for for differences, especially from the U.S. Okay, so um, yeah, okay. I mean, there's not much you can do to get around that, and there's no right answer there, but but the, you want to be aware of these things. Okay, all right. So, okay, so that's. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's my main caveat is, is, is just that um, careful about your assumptions. Assuming that every every country is the same, that can be dangerous, okay? Um, all right, this ended up not being so, so useful table, so I'll erase it. Okay, um, all right, now, I, th I think that's it kind of for leisure. Okay, um, let me just write my slides. Yeah, that's basically it for leisure. In the in the slides, when I did this derivation with the with the little labor leisure model thing, um, I also included this pi thing. So that's like your your capital income. So if if uh, let's pop over the slides. In the slides, your your consumption was your working hours times your wage plus pi, which is like whatever you're getting. Some I don't know. You own some stocks. You own some bonds. You got a retirement or whatever. Um, that additional factor. It complicates things a little bit. I mean, if, if pi was zero, you know, you get back to that just that one over one plus eta thing that we had before. It complicates things a little bit, but it's not it's not such a huge factor. Okay, so um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so then uh, all right. So so let's do inequality. All right, let's talk about inequality. Um, that's the the next thing, and after that will be life expectancy. Okay, but let's let's do inequality first. Okay, so inequality is um. Obviously, a thing. It's a, uh, I think, clearly important. Okay, um, and it's it's the it's the big thing that's lurking under a, a an aggregated GDP number because if you look at GDP numbers, you know any any if you think about the income distribution in a country, it's almost always the case that the mean of that in uh, the mean is higher than the median. Okay, so that, which which is to say that there's some distribution, and we'll see this pictorially in a second. There's there's usually a, a small number of extremely wealthy people in any country, right? Um, uh, and so what that does is it makes it so that the mean, 
you know, those those extremely wealthy people have a, a a large effect on the mean income, the average income. The median income, though, it's just it doesn't. It's just looking at that central person, right? So that that might give you some number, but then the mean is going to be higher because of the presence of these extremely wealthy people. Okay, so so for that reason, it, it, you know that GDP is like a mean, right? So GDP is the sum, right? The mean is just the sum divided by the number of people. Okay, so GDP is like it's more like an average or a mean than a median. Okay, um, and so for that reason, it's sort of masking, or it's yeah, it's it's kind of masking inequality, or, or in other words, the presence of a small number of very rich people will make GDP look good, but that doesn't mean it's a broad-based uh, wealth. Okay, so um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so so I guess I should just draw draw what I'm thinking here. Okay, so then if you think about, um, you know, we're going to be talking about. Let me let me give you some headings here: inequality. Inequality. All right. Okay. Um, so we're going to be talking about inequality, these income distributions. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use C for income. Okay. Like consumption, income, whatever you want. All right. And usually I'm going to call the distribution F of C. Okay. Because the a distribution is basically a function. Okay. If for every value of C for every income level, it's kind of telling you how many people are at that income level. Okay, and so you know a typical let's and let's say you can't have negative income. So a typical uh, income distribution, if I can draw it, is going to look like this. Okay, that's not so bad. Okay, it's it's not going to be normal, right? In the sense of um, Gaussian, right? Uh, so it, it's going to be kind of so around the so. So this would be like. Okay, so this is actually that peak there is would be the mode. Okay, it's the maximum of the distribution, but it's going to be also roughly the median. It doesn't have to be the median, but usually it's it, it is going to be. Okay, so um, around that peak, around this peak here, it's going to be kind of normal, kind of Gaussian, right? Uh, but well, for one, it's it's bounded at at zero. You can't have negative income, and the other thing is that. On the on the on the right hand side, on your right hand side, um, there's a lot of excess mass in in this region up here in the tails, right? Um, those are the very wealthy people, right? So th that's that's where you have uh, sort of more people in that tail than you would expect from just a regular old normal distribution, okay? Um, and the typical the sort of mathematical statistical term for that is a heavy tail. Okay, so it's it's heavier than what? Well, it's heavier than like uh, the baseline, which is which is sort of a normal distribution. Okay, and and the dynamic there is that um, you get a small number of people who who constitute a relatively large fraction of of the income or of the wealth. Okay, I'm going to use income and wealth kind of interchangeably here. Although obviously they're not the same thing. Uh, but um, you have a lot, relatively small number of people that constitute a large fraction of the wealth. Okay, so maybe you have you know ten percent of uh, the people account for 90% of the wealth or, you know, 20% of the people account for 80% of the wealth or something like that. Okay. So you get these situations where, where most of the wealth is controlled or, or sort of owned by a small number of people. Okay. So that's, you usually see that in almost any country when you look at the income distribution or the wealth distribution. Okay. Um, all right. So that's, that's what we're dealing with. Okay. So, and now this distribution, it's telling you, you know, for a given value, of c okay it's the 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 value of this f of c this function is saying what's the what's the mass of people there okay so it's it's not exactly a number okay because this is a continuum here right but it's telling me kind of relatively speaking how many people are there so the, you know, there's more people at the median than than there are at this point you know c1 whatever it is okay about twice as many okay um and then you can do that for each point all right um but it, so it is a distribution okay so yeah, any distribution this distribution that's almost the right spelling um yeah, any distribution is going to satisfy basically that if you sum it all up it's going to equal one okay so the, the integral of f of c dc is going to be one okay so that's not a one that's a zero almost one Okay, so any any distribution just mathematically has to satisfy that. All it's saying is that 
it's a hundred percent the the you know it would be silly to have distributions that didn't sum to one okay they integrate to one right so um that's one thing all right and so the, and so here we're implicitly like this is making things comparable across countries. It doesn't matter if it's a big country or a small country, we're just talking kind of proportion, what's the percentage of people at a point C, right? Um, so that's one, I mean, F of C should always, for any given C, it should be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, there can't be negative people at an income level, right? That's another property that we should satisfy. Okay, I mean, that's, and that's basically it. I mean, in general, okay? Uh, sometimes you might see people defining like capital F, that's just like how many people are. So, so little f of c tells you how many people are at c exactly. Uh, capital F tells you how many people are sort of less than or equal to c. Okay, so that would be mathematically you'd be integrate from zero to c, um, and then f of I guess I need to do, I need to do like a c prime kind of thing. C prime. So you integrate from zero to c. So in this case, you know, let's say we have another thing down here, c two. So that capital F would just be this area here. How many people are below that income level? Okay, um, right. So it's it's just the integral. It's just a cumulative integral. So it's it's going to be some sigmoid looking function. Okay, so the, the capital F would look like it's going to look like something like that, and it'll go from zero to one. Okay, so um, yeah. Okay, so those are just sort of the basics on distributions. Okay, and and. The stuff on the right is largely mathematical. Okay, just sort of is we're, we're asserting that it's it's those are sort of the rules of the game for distributions. On the left, I mean, distributions can look anything. They can have multiple peaks. They can be going up and down or whatever. But in general, if you're actually looking at you know income distributions in the data and the wealth distributions in the data, they're going to look like that thing right there. All right. Um, okay. So now, what uh what is that thing? Well, it. it I mean, in the most specific sense, it's just, it's data, right? I mean, it's, you, you look at, you look at all the people in a country, you say, well, how many people have income level C1 or something around C1? Okay. You can compute it, plot it. Okay. And you do the same thing for every income level and you generated a, a graph and that's your distribution. Okay. Or you could generate a spreadsheet or whatever. Um, okay. And so, uh, I guess I'm kind of scary in here, but you can see most of it. Um, so that's that's what it is in the most general sense. Um, we for for our purposes, we we need to think about it a little bit theoretically. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of note <clears throat> how should I say this? We're gonna kind of note that this looks a lot like a particular type of mathematical distribution or class of distributions. Um, very very similar, in fact. Uh, and so we're, we're going to kind of think about it in, in the theoretical realm as, as being analogous to that. Okay. So what does that mean? There's a bunch of different types of distributions out there. Okay. So you, you, you probably heard of like the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution, which is just, um, so new page types of distributions. Okay. Um, you know, so there, there's normal or Gaussian. Okay. Which is just, uh, this is not going to be, that's actually not so bad, except it's a little off center. Uh, but it's, you know, sort of this, this, uh, symmetric curve and it kind of falls off relatively quickly, quickly. Um, and if we want to write that, you know, we can, we can write the function for that. Okay. I'm going to write out the whole thing. You don't have to worry about all of it really, honestly. Um, but if we must. We may as well do it exactly. Um, so this is going to be some factor times uh, c minus mu over sigma squared, and we need a one half there. Okay, let me let me make that squared log logical for your benefit. Okay, so that's what the normal curve actually looks like if we're thinking about things as distribution functions. Okay, it's it's basically e to the minus c squared. Okay, so you can see this c here. We subtract off the mean and we divide by the variance, but it's basically something like e to the minus c squared or e to the minus one half c squared. Okay, so as c gets larger in either direction, c squared gets large and, and you're doing e to the minus that thing. And so you're, you're, you're decaying exponentially 
on uh, as you go in either direction, right? So that's that's why it falls off so quickly. It's decaying exponentially, and that's why we say it has thin tails. Okay, these down here and here fall down to zero. Not they don't hit zero, but they fall down to zero very quickly. Okay, and the idea is that um, if something normally distributed, you know, it's going to be in a certain range. You know, you can you can define sort of like a uh, minus two sigma. Rough. This is approximately plus two sigma. Okay, it's going to be in, mostly in that plus or minus two sigma range. Okay, uh, and then outside of that, it's, it's relatively small, relatively rare. Okay, um, okay. You know, you, you can. Um, there are a million other distributions. I, I I won't go through them all. Like you could, there's the the uniform distribution, which is just sort of like a box. It's just like you're somewhere between zero and one, and it's equal probability. Okay, so that'd be like uniform. Okay, and that's just actually it's just f of c equals c. No, sorry, f of c equals one in this whole range. Okay, um, okay, but there's a million different dis distributions you can do. Okay, normal is um, the normal or, or Gaussian distribution is actually special in certain ways uh, mathematically because um, let's say you you go out and you have a bunch of you go out and measure stuff, temperature every day, or you look at a stock on a particular day, or you, you know, ask people how many friends that they have, stuff like that. And let's say you, you do that a lot and take the average. Okay. It turns out that um, if you look at the distribution of these things, where you're averaging a bunch of things, a bunch of things together, regardless of how the individuals are distributed, the average tends to be normal. Okay. The no so the normal distribution arises naturally in many settings um sort of miraculously even uh and it's 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 just sort of um i don't know you can prove it mathematically this is called the central limit theorem that that when you start averaging things together they tend towards normally distributed okay um but they don't always do that okay um and in the case of this these wealth distributions that's that's not going to be quite true but it's going to be kind of true all right in, in in and so you know, you can see, if you look at the normal distribution here, it's kind of reminiscent, and, and let's say that this was zero, okay? Um, and like, the, the, the axis should go through the peak of the normal distribution. So let's see if I can actually, there we go. So this would be a, a proper representation. Okay, so that that's a normal distribution. So our wealth distribution is kind of like that. I mean, it's, it's single peak that falls off on either side. But first of all, our, our, our or rather our income distribution should not be negative. Okay, so over here, things are negative. Okay, we, we don't want that. Okay, and also it's a little bit fatter tails. Okay, so we need to, to work on that too. All right, um, and one thing we can do is instead of saying that consumption itself is normally distributed, we could say something like the log of consumption is an hour tilde for like normal, is like normal distributed okay right so so the um if the if the log of c is normal then c is sort of like the exponential of a normal okay right so then if you think think about taking the exponential of the distribution uh this distribution up here okay um if it was zero the exponential would be one, okay? If it was a very large negative number, the exponential would be zero. If it was a very large positive number, the exponential would be really, really large, okay? So it's always positive, okay? It still has that sort of single peak nature, okay? And it has these very, very wealthy people, okay? All right, so so it, it kind of gives us everything we need, right? So you, if, you, if you think about kind of exponentiating that, it's gonna be, it's gonna look something like this. And this is, you know, exactly what I drew on the previous slide, basically. Okay, so it's going to be some kind of single peak thing, uh, but it's going to have heavy tails and it's going to be positive. Okay, so this this is what we call log normal in the sense that the log of C is normally distributed. Okay, so that's log dash normal. Okay, so that's that's what this means. Okay. Um, all right, so, so it's going to turn out basically that the... the um, the log normal distribution, which is another common one, uh, is describes uh, income and wealth distributions very well. Okay, and so you know, um, 
and, and by that I mean like you know in truth you let's say you go out and you measure um I need to use colors uh, let's say you go out and measure the real data distribution of of income in a particular country maybe you get something like this okay in the red okay what I'm saying is that you you can find a um you can fit a normal distribution to that red line let's say that the, the best fit is the white one it, it's not going to be exact but it's going to be pretty darn close okay that's what i'm saying um it's, this isn't exactly 100 percent what the data looks like but it's going to be pretty darn close okay so that's good enough for us we're going to approximate okay um all right so 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 i'm arguing the log normal is, is good for for matching the data okay um now there's there's the, you know, again, as with that eta before, remember, we have some free parameters, okay? And in particular, um, I guess I should, yeah. Um, and in particular, we're going to have uh, basically the mean, which I'm going to call mu, and the standard deviation, or the, or the variance or whatever, okay? Okay, so so any, any normal distribution has a mean, okay? Because if, if I wanted to write it on this normal distribution up here, I could I could have just written mu okay so that's where the mean is and then this is mu plus two sigma and mu minus two sigma so any normal distribution is going to have a mean where that center peak is and then sigma which is how wide the peak is okay right so the the, the width you have the, the the location of the peak and then how wide it is okay that's mu and sigma mean and variance okay um and that's true for uh that's true for log normal okay so we're gonna um you know the so you, you, you kind of take the you take a normal with mean mu and variance sigma and then you exponentiate it. That's 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 what the log normal is. Okay, so um, you know this peak here is then the log of mu and then the sigma kind of defines how wide the distribution is. Okay, but but we're exponentiating it again. So um, so so I guess what I'm saying is. You, it, it's it's clear sort of in a normal distribution what it, mu is the center and sigma is the width. Okay, when you go to log normal, <clears throat> it's still basically the center and the width, but but you, you because you're exponentiating it, it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, but but it basically tells you where is where is that peak located and how wide are things going up and down into the tails. Okay. Um, all right. So so and and so we have these free variables mu and sigma. Okay, and we're gonna want to get those somehow. Okay. We want to we want to choose those basically so that we fit the data the best. I guess is what I'm saying. Okay, that's that's what we want to do. All right. Um. Okay, so that's that's the goal. All right. And once we do that, then then we're gonna be in pretty good shape. Okay. Um. All right, but I guess I should. I kind of want to link this back to the analysis first and then circle back and say, this is how you find mu and sigma. Okay, so maybe we should do that, all right? So, um, yeah, let's do that, all right? Okay, so 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 this is kind of argued, okay, log normal is, is what we're going for here, okay? We want to find mu and sigma that sort of best fit the data, okay? Now, but remember, what we care about, the whole point of this was thinking about welfare. Right, so let's let's try and link it back to that. Okay, um, so the whole point was was thinking about welfare. Okay, now remember the welfare. Uh, the way we, you know, well, first of all, the you know, utility in that really simple setting that we started out with was just uh, sorry, there should be U, U of C was was a log the log of C, right? For for an individual person we, we said that the ufc was the log of c okay and then when we were doing the really simple stuff with just pure consumption or even with leisure we we assumed that either there was just one person in every country or there were many people but they all had the exact same income okay so clearly if we want to have inequality we need to break we need to not make that assumption okay so um all right and so uh now it's still going to be true that for a given person, let's index people by i. Okay, for a given person, you know the utility of having ci is going to be log of ci. We'll still keep that assumption. 
Um, but now if we want to think about welfare in a particular country, okay. Um, well, essentially we want, uh, we want to have the welfare be the, the average utility in that country. Okay. So we're, remember we're utilitarian. Okay. We're using this, the utilitarian, uh, welfare function. Just look at the average of the utility over everyone in the country. Right. Um, okay. And so the way we wrote that before utilitarian. The way we wrote that before was that W was one over N times the sum of U of CI from like N equals one. Okay, so we summed over all N people and just took the average utility. Okay. Now, um, we can do that. It, 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 often though, it's, it's easier to think about instead of there being N people, there's like a continuum of people. Okay, because we're doing this stuff, this distributional stuff in a continuum of people, you can say that there's there's like a continuum of people from zero to one, okay? Um, they each have some utility CI and you're integrating over I, okay? Right, so these two are, like these are kind of equivalent. It's just like, do you have N people or do you have like an infinite number of people, right? It turns out it's a little, math, just mathematically, it's a little bit easier to think about having sort of an infinite number of people, okay? Um, because, well, it is, all right? Um, it, it's not, it actually doesn't make a huge difference either way, so, but, but let's say we do that, okay? So, uh, all right, so then in that, in that case, right, let's say we stick with that utilitarian infinite number of people, that welfare is going to be, you know, integral from zero to one, the log of CI, the I, okay. Um, and, and then let's on top of that, say that CI is this log normal distribution, right? CI is, uh, in the, in this particular country has a log normal distribution with some parameters, mu and sigma here. Okay. Um, now look up here, you know, the, the, the definition of that distribution is that the log is normally distributed, right? So if you look at it in just the raw C, it's going to look like this, but if you plot it in logs, it's going to look like, you know, the friend, the normal distribution. Okay. And in particular, that normal distribution is going to have mean mu, right? So that means that this thing here, this W is actually uh, just mu. Okay, it's just mu because this integral here is just saying take the average over everyone in the country of the log of ci, the expect the expected value or the mean or whatever you want to call it. Okay, by definition, that's going to be mu. Okay, so it's not always that not obvious. I mean, it's it's a very simple answer. It's very surprisingly simple, but. It, um, if you think about, you know, the way it's, the way that the log normal is defined, you're saying that the log is normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma or standard deviation sigma, then the ex sort of the average of the log, is just going to be mu. Okay. Those two things are, are basically equivalent. Okay. So, um, so that's going to be our welfare. If we're log normal income distribution and utilitarian approach to welfare. Okay. Um, all right. So then our goal really, in some sense, should be to find mu. Okay. Um, and if we do that, then we're all set. Okay. Um, and if we, so we find mu, we basically found welfare is what I'm saying. Okay. So that's, that's sort of the motivation. Okay. Now, why don't we just find mu? Well, we're going to, but it turns out that it's somewhat difficult. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Okay, so how would you find mu? If you were a government or whatever, you have your country, you're there, you're doing your thing, you're, you're well funded, how would you find mu? Well, if you want to do it the brute force way, you'd go out and ask everyone their income, you take the log of it, and then you just average all of those up. Okay? And that would give you mu. And welfare, equivalently, right? So that would be one method. Okay? Now, the trouble is that even though that's certainly possible, okay? Um, 
like we many countries do not do that or, or if they do do it they're not they don't release it they'll just tell you like averages okay so that's that's a little tough okay um so uh we need to be a little bit more clever okay now what countries often do tell you is they'll tell you the average income right um they'll tell you the average income okay but that's not mu right because mu is the average of the log okay what 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 countries tell you when they report average income is they're telling you you know the integral of ci right over each person the average is ci okay which i'll call just like c bar okay so what you see in the, if you see data in the if, in average income report in the data you'll see something like c that's that's more like an average of c not the log of c c bar okay um, which is good. That's useful, but it's not exactly what we want. Okay. Um, right now it turns out that, um, if you, uh, if you think about the, the average of C in a log normal distribution, okay. So the average of the log is mu. If you think about just the average of C itself, okay. It turns out that you can show, and it's well, it's kind of an annoying derivation, but you can show that's going to be e to the mu plus one half sigma squared. Okay, that's very non obvious. Okay, so this 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 you know you have to do a annoying integral integration or like completing the square or something like that uh, to get this, but you can show this, and they you know people have already done it. They put it on Wikipedia. It's all there, right? So um, <clears throat> it turns out you get this. And so what's the intuition? Um, well. Uh, clearly mu should be relevant. You, know, you might think that that um, if the average of log C is mu, then the average of C should just be e to the mu, right? You'd undo that log by exponentiating it, okay? So that's kind of what you have, but then you also have this sigma squared term, okay? And it turns out that the way that the log normal works, these types of distributions, it, if you have those really rich people, that sigma is high, you have a, a wide heavy tail distribution, you have some very poor people, but you also have some very rich people. Okay. And the effect of having those very rich people is to sort of boost up that average income or in some sense artificially. Okay. So you're, so you're, you're, uh, you know, the, the presence of, uh, you know, these folks out here and even farther kind of boosts up that average income. And if Sigma's bigger, there's more of those folks out there. Okay. That's the intuition for why, you get this, okay? And so remember, you know, so so this is like, um, this, you know, this this is our, our important equation here, okay? So so it's saying, you know, if your distribution was log normal with parameters mu and sigma, then you would expect to see the average income of you know e to the mu plus one half sigma squared, okay? All right, and so. How does this help us? Well, think about, you know, what we need to think about is what do we observe in the data? Okay. And what are things that sort of exist theoretically in our brains? Okay. So we, we observe C bar in the data, basically. Okay. You can take, geez, uh, you can take, you can just, oftentimes it's reported directly, or you can say, well, GDP is X divided by population. That's average income. Okay. That's C bar. We kind of we looked at, that's what we were looking at before basically okay so we observe c bar in the data we want to find mu and we want to find sigma squared if it, really we want to find mu because if we find mu then we have welfare from this from this up here right so we want to find mu okay and we observe c bar all right so one thing you can do is just you know starting from that c bar equation take a log of c bar the log of c bar is going to be the log of the exponential of that thing inside which is just the thing itself okay so if you take logs of that equation you're going to get the log of c bar is mu plus one half sigma squared right so remember the log of the average is the different for, different from the average of the log that's why the, that why we have to go through this whole thing basically okay so the log of c bar again the left hand side still is stuff that functions of stuff that we observe in the data is equal to mu minus one half sigma squared. Okay. And then if we want to sort of solve for mu, then it's going to be the log of C bar 
minus one half sigma squared. Okay. And that's welfare too, right? W. So this is a step forward, but it's not the whole thing, unfortunately, but it's a step forward. Okay, so we know we can observe C bar in the data and compute log of C bar, okay? But now the problem is we don't know sigma squared, okay? So we almost know mu, which is our, which is our goal, but we still don't quite know sigma squared. Okay, what's that variance? How how spread out is this? Okay, and um, we want to know sigma squared. So what's the deal? So we'll, we'll, what we need is we need more direct evidence on inequality, right? So that C bar data point really should, it, it'll tell us about, I mean, it tells us about some combination of the mean and variance, okay? So it tells us, yeah, it tells us a little bit, but, but we do need additional data, not just on the averages, but on that actual distribution, okay? So, um, how do we get that? Well, uh, it turns out that, um, again, countries don't just report, if, if countries reported their mu, the, lot, the the average of the log of income, we wouldn't have to do this whole this whole reshuffling thing, right? Um, if they reported the sigma, the, the variance of the log of income, we, that'd be great, but you know, but they don't, okay? But they actually do report um, oftentimes information on inequality, okay? In, in in the form of one number, which is called the Gini index, okay? Perhaps you've heard of it. I I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if other classes have covered it. Um, so, but the Gini index is, is is the most popular measure of inequality, okay? And, it, and it's important in its own right as an object of, of, of study, okay? Um, and so basically, uh, uh, well, it's actually kind of complicated, um, but let me let me give you the, the basic idea. Um, Gini index. If I have time, I have six minutes, I think. Yeah. Gini index. I can give you sort of intuition for it. Um, Gini index has nothing to do with genies. It's just a person's name. Okay. That's the first thing about the Gini index. Um, it's kind of magical, though. So the way the Gini index has a cool sort of graphical explanation. Okay. But, um, to explain the Gini index, you have to also explain something called the Lorenz curve. Okay. There's like 60 different Lorenzes of very, that do like physics and math. I don't know which one it is, um, but it's one of them. And then sometimes there's the Lorenz with a T. It's very confusing, but this is without a T. Um, probably a mathematician of some sort. And and so the Lorenz curve is, it's something that you can compute about uh, any distribution basically, or about, any like data set, okay? And what you do is you say, okay, on the x-axis, we're looking, we're gonna look at the income quantile. I'm gonna write it in terms of income, but it, it's true for like a general mathematical thing. We're gonna write the income quantile. So what is that? That means um, <clears throat> order people by their income. Person zero is the poorest person. Person one is the richest person. I keep saying Bezos. I don't remember if it's Bezos. It could be Musk. It doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. So whoever the rich person is, they're indexed by one. The poorest person is indexed by zero. Okay. Um, order them. Okay. And then you look at the share of income that's accounted for people at that level or below. Okay. So what does that mean? So at zero, if you just take the poorest person, the share of income that the poorest person accounts for is it's effectively zero. Okay. It's, it's like tiny, you know, one in a million percent or something. Okay. So but let's say it's zero. Okay. Uh, then you do the, the same thing. I'm just going to like map out the different data points, do the same thing for the richest person. What's the share of income accounted for by the richest person and anyone poorer than them? Well, that's one hundred percent. So we'll just say one. Okay. So this thing should be one at one and zero at zero. Okay. And the question is, is, you know, is it concave? Is it a linear thing? Is it convex? It turns out it has to be convex. Okay, so I'm going to draw a dotted line, which is the linear option, which it is not in general. It turns out that it has to be something like this, because the poorer people, uh, they're poorer. They have less money, right? So they they're going to have a, a a smaller contribution to um, the total share of income. Right, so this is the share of income. 
for people less than that, they're going to have a smaller contribution to, so, so, so let's say you looked at like the 10%, 0.1. So you look at the 10th percent poorest person and everyone poorer than them, they're going to account for less than 10% of income, probably a lot less in most cases. Okay. So this thing's going to be below that 45 degree line. But then if you look at, as you get up to the rich people, then they, they start accounting for more and more sort of proportionally, right? Um, the income, so, and it has to hit one at the end, right? So it's going to be convex, okay? Um, the only time it would be perfectly linear is if you had a perfectly equal society in which everyone had a, a, about the same income, then it would be perfectly linear. Okay, we'll see that, okay? So that's the Lorenz curve. And I'm, I'm, yeah, so, the, so I'll basically tell you what Gini is and then we'll finish up. Um, that's the Lorenz curve. Now the Gini index is just, it's just the area in here between the 45 degree line and the Lorenz curve itself, right? So this, the line here is the Lorenz curve, the, the convex one, the area between that uh, line and the, and the 45 degree line is, but it, it's not exactly the Gini index. Call that area A, okay? And then the Gini index is, let me think, one minus two A. Uh, so the Gini index, yeah, one minus two A. Okay, so if you live in a, a a perfectly, actually it's two A. It, it's one of those things. I think it's two A. So if you live in a perfectly equal society, okay, you'd have that Lorenz curve would be on the uh, uh, forty-five degree line, and so that area A would be zero, and there'd be nothing between them. And so the G Gini index would be zero. You have zero inequality because you live in a perfectly equal utopia. Um, if you have infinite, if you have infinite inequality in the sense that there's one person who has all the the income and no one else makes anything, you'd kind of truck along the x-axis, right? Because no one has any share of the income. And then when you get to that richest person, boom, you jump right up to one. Okay. So the most the unequal society you could ever imagine with one dictator who owns everything. That and that area then would be that whole half triangle, the whole the whole triangle in here, right? Um, that that has area one half, and so when you double it, you get g equals one. Okay, so g goes from zero to one. The reason you double it is, is so instead of going from zero to a half, it goes from zero to one. Okay, and it's a measure of inequality. Okay, so zero is is no inequality, and one is complete inequality. Okay, but of course. You know, you'll be somewhere in between. Usually, a Lorenz curve is going to look like something like this. Okay. Um, all right. So that's your Gini index, and it turns yeah. So I'm I'm out of time, but but essentially from the Gini index, we're going to be able to find sigma, right? We can plug that in before from the earlier thing and find mu now, and then we'll be able to find welfare. And that's it. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. So so that's all I have for today. Um, We'll finish up, kind of close the loop on this 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 uh, inequality stuff. Um, next time, then we'll talk about uh, life expectancy um, and how that factors in, and then we'll have sort of the whole uh, uh, beyond GDP story put together, and we can look at some data regarding that. Okay, so yeah, I'll see you guys. Uh, I'll see you on Thursday. Office hours are basically now, so stick around if you want to uh, go to that. All right.